Hello and welcome to Caller Capital's Secondary Market Webinar. My name is Rosita Montero. I'm a principal on Caller's Investor Relations team. Our webinar speakers today are all based in our New York office. We have Eric Foran, a partner who focuses on GP-led investments, Ed Goldstein, a partner and chief investment officer of Collar's credit business, and Daisy Wong, a principal who focuses on LP-led investments. There is a lot of optimism that 2024 will be a big year for secondaries, and I'm excited to be joined by my colleagues to talk about the global dynamics, shaping the market, and what the rest of the year may bring. If you have questions during this webinar, please submit them via the Ask a Question button on the screen, and we will get back to you after the session. In the first half of 2023, we saw global macroeconomic headwinds affecting bid-ask spreads to the point where some buyers and sellers could not agree on valuations to successfully transact. Eric, how has the economic climate changed since then, and what are the implications for the secondaries market? Uh, thanks, Rosita. So overall, the macroeconomic environment has improved. Uh, interest rates have stabilized. Uh, public market confidence has come back. The public markets have recovered over the course of uh, last year. And um, an investor confidence is coming back into the markets. Now, all of that being said, LPs are still facing a big liquidity uh, challenge. Um, investors are over allocated to private equity and uh, many investors are not receiving the distributions that they originally modeled out of their private equity portfolio. There's almost $3 trillion of unrealized FMV in the ground today just in buyout funds. Um, to put that into context, that's four times what it was back in the global financial crisis. Um, that should continue to support the activity in the secondary market. And it should be no surprise that last year, so 2023, ended up being the second highest year ever in terms of secondary volume. 2023 was a challenging year for fundraising overall, but we saw some big secondary fundraises. Uh, what does that mean for market dynamics? Uh, yeah, that's right. Uh, secondary private equity had a great fundraising year last year relative to the rest of private equity. I think that's a reflection of how investors see the risk return profile of secondary private equity, and in particular, how compelling it can be in these moments of time where liquidity is uh, needed by investors in illiquid asset classes. The market itself continues to be very well balanced. Um, so while there's been a lot of capital raised within secondary private equity, there's been a growth in underlying transaction volume. And so as we think about the overall supply demand balance, it continues to be pretty well balanced as it has been for the last decade or so. And relative to the primary private equity markets, um, it's a much better supply demand dynamic. Daisy, are more transactions getting done? Do you find buyers and sellers to be on the same page as it relates to valuations? Yes. Yeah, so as Eric had said, 2023 was a the second highest uh, year in terms of transaction volume in the secondary space. And similarly, in the LP let market, it was also a record year in terms of the volume of transactions that was done being the second highest in its history. In terms of what's driving that trend, there's an improvement of buyer sentiment um, across all of the reasons that Eric had outlined earlier, public market valuations having um, improved over the course of 2023 and into 2024, the stabilization of interest rates and generally earnings for public companies have either surprised on the upside or been consistent with consensus. So um, all of those factors have led to a narrowing of the bid ask spread on transactions in the LP led side of the market and specifically on portfolios of um, high quality buyout companies managed by uh, blue chip managers, there has been a real narrowing of spread in terms of the bid ask spread. And so there, so that would lead you to believe that there is generally a more of an agreement around valuations than there have been previously. On other parts of the market, for example, venture growth, the bid ask spread is still quite wide um, on those types of transactions. So that would lead you to believe there's still a little bit of a gap in terms of what buyers and sellers are seeing as fair valuations for that side of the market. 
Stacey, talk to us about the seller side. What motivated sellers to, to transact last year? Yeah, um, liquidity, right? I think Eric mentioned it. Um, the need for liquidity as uh, distributions have slowed down due to a lack of um, M&A volume and IPO markets. Uh, and that slowdown has led to even continued uh, continue outflows that doesn't aren't matched by the inflows of distributions. Um, that's been a lot of the driving force behind uh, many reasons why um, a lot of the LPs are, have come to market in the secondary market. Uh, in terms of some of the key trends that we're seeing uh, or we saw last year, I think I would highlight four uh, areas, um, one being that um, there's a real leaning in into uh, high quality um, assets from blue chip managers. That's an area that's very well received by the secondaries market. Um, we saw an increase in larger transactions being done. So billion dollar plus transactions, um, younger vintages. I think to, the statistics say something like the average vintage last year was a whole year younger than the previous year. Um, and then finally, we've also seen um, more managed fund structures with some element of primary capital um, so that managers can continue to deploy um, and invest with the key relationships that matter. With the bid ask spread narrowing, what does pricing look like now? Yeah, so pricing in 2023 was around uh, 82 cents. Um, across all strategies, and that's an improvement from uh, even the first half of the year where it was is somewhere in the high 70s. Um, I think what, it, and that bifurcates between different strategies. Um, like I had said earlier, uh, high quality buyout is trading something in, in close to the 90s, and there's a real leaning in to managers that people uh, know and assets that they, uh, that they like. Um, and infrastructure, uh, private equity has also been an area that uh, pricing has been quite robust. Um, and, and, and as I had said earlier, the venture growth side, um, there's, there's a bigger gap. Daisy, what is the outlook for LP LEDs for the rest of 2024? Yeah, we expect 2024 to be a record volume year at $65 billion in LP LED volume. Uh, we expect to continue to see larger portfolios of billion dollar sizes plus come to market and uh, solved by a combination of mosaic and uh, uh, structured solutions. Eric, many thought the GP led market would have been more subdued in 2023 relative to 2022, but we saw an increase in deal volume. What do you think drove this activity? Yeah, so 2023, we saw just over $50 billion of transaction volume in the GP led market. Uh, that's up from mid to high 40 billions in 2022. Uh, if you look at the 10 largest secondary transactions last year, five were GP LEDs. Four were multi-asset transactions. One was a single asset transaction and all of which were greater than $1.5 billion in transaction size. What trends are you seeing across different types of GP LED investments? For the most part, continuation funds are the most popular type of transaction. Last year, we saw an uptick in the number of multi-asset continuation funds as buyers try to find more diversification in the underlying transactions and GPs and sellers realize by adding more companies to a transaction, they may be able to get greater liquidity out of the transaction itself. Uh, multi-assets were about half of the overall GP-led market. About a third of the market were single asset continuation funds. And so the idea where sponsors can continue owning companies for longer, um, raising capital to support those companies whilst giving the existing investors a liquidity option, um, that trend continues. It makes a lot of sense, especially in this environment where uh, LPs are seeking liquidity. You know, on balance, um, over 90% of investors are taking liquidity when presented the option. And that compares to you know, zip code 75% going back a couple of years. What does the investment team look for when screening such investments, given that there is such a large volume in supply? Yeah, there's a, a wide ranging type of transaction structure within the GP led market. Um, at Collar, we're looking to lead or co-lead these transactions. That's our most comfortable place. We like setting valuation, we like setting terms, both economic and governance, and um, being uh, a lead investor in these transactions. Um, 
we're looking for great companies. We're looking for sponsors that know these industries inside and out. We do business with groups that we've known for a long time, uh, but we also do business with GPs that we're getting uh, to know and have gotten to know more, more recently. The average investment size can be anywhere from one or $200 million up to four or $500 million for a multi-asset transaction for us. And uh, of course, could go bigger under the right circumstances. What are your thoughts on the GP-led forecast for 2024? So we expect 2024 to be up on 2023. Now we're currently forecasting $65 billion in volume, and that compares to just over $50 billion in volume in, in 2023. Uh, 2023, we saw a pickup in activity in the second half of the year, and that uh, activity has continued early on here in the first half of 2024. Shifting gears now to credit secondaries, uh, as we've covered in the last few webinars, this is one of the gr fastest growing parts of the market. Ed, have you seen momentum slow at all in, in 2023? Uh, not really, it's been the opposite. I would say really since we closed our first fund, we've just seen an acceleration in growth of the market. It's interesting because private credit, it's still newer to the secondaries market, so it's less intermediated. Uh, so what that means is the reported data is just, it's not as robust. So you'll read reports that say 5% of the market was credit last year. Just based upon what we've seen come across our desks, uh, a lot of non-intermediated non transactions, we think it's a very conservative number and will continue to grow. The, the other way I would look at it is, you know, secondary, it's a derivative of primary. So um, as the primary direct lending market matures, and I use direct lending because that's the biggest chunk of the market, um, you'll start to see that natural rate of turnover come in just as it did with private equity you're going back the last couple of decades. What macroeconomic factors uh, affect credit secondaries and what do you think we should keep an eye on in 2024? So I'd probably break that into two buckets. Uh, one is the market and the other is performance. So on the market side, you know, Daisy mentioned earlier, slow down in M&A, fewer IPOs, driving need for liquidity for you know, owners of private equity. It's really the same in credit. It's, you know, the, the liquidity needs are the same, the drivers are the same, it's just really they're selling a different asset. So, so th there's, there's a lot of similarity there. On the performance side, a distinction I would make is that most of private credit is floating rate. So you think about the underlying performance of what we're underwriting um, and what we're buying uh, in a rising rate environment that will, on the margin, will help performance. And you know, as rates decline, that could impact performance negatively. I would highlight also though, in a higher rate environment, um, that could impact um, things like interest coverage or liquidity underlying companies. So, so there's a bit of a double-edged sword impact of rising rates, but, but on, on average, you know, higher rates are, are, are good for credit and credit secondaries. What will the near-term future for credit secondaries look like? So the way the market's developing, uh, it's still young. Uh, we are seeing more capital formation, uh, but I would say just as on the private equity side, uh, there is a, um, a significant undercapitalization of the market, even with new entrants. Uh, one of the benefits of new entrants, in particular in credit, is uh, diversification in credit is arguably more important than equity because it's, a, it's an asset that has asymmetric downside risk. So in managing large deals with potential concentration, sometimes multiple buyers can help get a transaction done. The other thing that we will see and starting are starting to see is more specialization, meaning uh, I talked about senior direct lending being the largest chunk of the market, but uh, you, you can see um, funds specializing only in senior where they have a lower cost of capital uh, to funds specializing in distressed, opportunistic credit, uh, asset-based finance where you know they're more they're more niche today, but as those underlying markets grow, you you can potentially see more specialization in in credit secondaries. Uh, the other area I would highlight is NAV lending, um, which, you know, in the world of secondaries, if you think about it, um, the underwriting is very similar. You're underwriting pools of cash flows, and we might find whether it's on the equity side of the business or on the credit side of the business that the better risk proposition for us is is not to buy the assets or to buy the funds, but to lend against them. And so, so that's led to uh, the growth of that part of the market where you know, it's a credit product, so it fits neatly within the credit secondaries uh, remit. But again, 
we're taking the assets as collateral rather than outright purchasing. So it's, uh, we, we see that as, a, as another big growth area in credit secondaries. As we look back over the past year, what is your biggest takeaway from 2023? I would say the best word to describe last year would probably be resilient. If you look back to the last webinar where our colleague John Liu talked about secondaries as an all-weather strategy, I would say last year really proved that out. Uh, you heard earlier uh, Eric and Daisy talk about volatility, bid offer spreads earlier in the year that that normalized over the course of the year, uh, which which is typical in our market. And so I would expect you know even with a strong start to this year, uh, it's it's you know there'll be fits and starts to the market. Uh, but what I would say is that consistently over time, given the depth of the market, LPs and GPs know that there is always a place to go to if they need liquidity. And I think that that's going to be a key theme for for the years to come for the secondaries market. Eric, looking forward, what is the forecast for secondaries overall in 2024? Yeah, so for private equity secondaries, um, we expect the recent momentum to continue. Uh, there are some market participants who are forecasting the highest year ever in terms of secondary transaction volume. As we sit here today, we're forecasting $130 billion in volume, and that's going to be split roughly equally between the LP-led and the GP-led side of the market. Daisy, could you expand on broader trends that we expect this year? Right. Transaction sizes will get bigger. We expect to continue to see multi-billion dollar uh, portfolios come to market. The market will continue to specialize. Um, in addition to credit, uh, we expect more specialization in the infrastructure secondaries aspect of the market. And then on private equity secondaries, expectation is that there will be uh, innovation. And then lastly, we've talked about private wealth in previous webinars. That trend of private wealth investors coming into the secondaries market will be a trend that we expect to continue to see in 2024. 2024 is off to a strong start for secondaries, and many are bullish and expect an increase in the breadth and depth of the market this year. I'm grateful to Eric, Ed, and Daisy for joining me today. If you submitted a question during this webinar, we'll get back to you shortly. If you have feedback on your webinar experience, please share your thoughts using the survey on this platform. From the entire Caller Capital team, thank you for tuning in.